Okay, hello Cloud Gurus and welcome to this lecture. This lecture is on S3 and as I mentioned in the last lecture, S3 is one of the oldest AWS services and it makes up an awful lot of the Certified Solutions Architect Associate exam. So what is S3? Well, S3 basically stands for Simple Storage Service. So it's three S's, that's why it's called S3. And it provides developers and IT teams with secure, durable, highly scalable object storage. And S3 is easy to use the simple web services interface to store and retrieve any amount of data from anywhere on the web. So what does that actually mean? Well, basically S3 is a safe place to store your files. And that's all it means by objects. So when we say object storage, we're talking about uh, things, flat files, basically. So Word documents, pictures, movies, et cetera, et cetera. So S, S3 is basically a safe place to store your files. It's object-based storage. And the data is spread across multiple devices and multiple facilities. And so the basics of S3 are as follows. It's object-based. It allows you to upload files. And your files can be anywhere from zero bytes all the way up to five terabytes. There is unlimited storage and files are stored in these things called buckets. Now, when I first heard about buckets, it sounded a bit strange, but a bucket is basically just a folder. That's all it is. So it's a folder in which to put your files. Now, the thing about S3 is that S3 is a universal namespace. So what does that actually mean? Well, all that means is that, that the names must be unique globally. So when I create a bucket, I can't just use test bucket because someone's already taken that. I can't use a cloud guru because I took that a long, long time ago uh, in another AWS account. So when you create a bucket, the name has to be unique. And the reason for that is it's actually creating a web address. So if we were going to create a bucket in Northern Virginia, which is the default AWS region, and we call it a cloud guru, it's going to create a web address, a cloud guru.s3.amazonaws.com. Alternatively, if we were to create the bucket not in Northern Virginia, but let's say an island, it would generate this name. So it would be a cloud guru, so the bucket name, and then dot, and then EU West one, which is the region, and then dot amazonaws.com. So those are the two different types of examples of bucket names. Like I said, S3 is a universal namespace. So all, all that you have to remember is that bucket names must be unique. And the reason for that is you're actually creating a web address. Now, when you upload a file to S3, you're going to receive a HTTP 200 code if the upload was successful, and that's going to come back to your browser. And that can be a very popular exam topic. So just remember, if you have a scenario question, and it's looking at you uploading a file to S3 and it asks you what code you receive back, it's a HTTP 200 code back to your browser. Moving on, I keep saying that S3 is object-based and just to think of objects as files and objects basically consist of the following. So we've got a key and this is simply the name of the object. So the file name of the object. We then have the value and this is simply the data that is made up of a sequence of bytes. So it's just the uh, data. We then have a version ID and this is important for versioning and we're going to have a lab on versioning but effectively S3 allows you to have multiple versions of your file. So you could have version one which says hello cloud gurus and then you could go in and upload a file um, with the same name uh, and change uh, the file so it says hello cloud gurus uh, welcome to version two or something like that. And then you'll have both versions of the object in S3 and you'll be able to do version control. So you could go back to a previous version. So S3 allows you to do versioning. And like I said, we're gonna have a lab on that. We also then have metadata. If you've never heard the term metadata before, it just simply means um, data about data. Um, so it's data about the data that you're storing. So you may say, okay, this belongs, this object belongs to the finance department. This is our payroll spreadsheet, something like that. And then it has a bunch of different sub resources so we have access control lists and we also have torrents. We are going to cover off access control lists and bucket policies coming up. So now that you know what S3 is and that it's just a safe place to store your objects in the cloud, I will, you really have to understand the data consistency model for S3 going into your exam. So how does S3 keep your data consistent? 
Well, basically, S3 has two things. It has read after write consistency for puts of new objects, and then it has eventual consistency for overwrite puts and deletes. Now, I know what you're thinking. What does that mean? Well, the first one, read after write consistency for puts of new objects, all that means is, is if you upload a file to S3, you are able to read it immediately. So you are able to read it straight after writing to it, and that's basically you're just doing a, a put of that object into S3. Now, if you were good to go in and um, basically update that object or delete that object, so overwrite that object, then it's only going to be eventual consistency. So let's say we've got version one of a file and then we upload version two and you immediately try and read that object. Basically, what's going to happen is um, you you might get version one or you might get version two. But if you wait like a second, you're always going to get version two. So there's an eventual consistency for overwrite puts and deletes. So only when you're overwriting a file or you're deleting a file, eventually it's going to be consistent. That's all that means. So you have read after write consistency for puts of new objects and you have eventual cons consistency for overwrite puts and deletes. So in other words, if you write a new file and read it immediately afterwards, you'll be able to view that data. And if you update an existing file or delete a file and read it immediately, you may get the older version or you may not. Basically, the changes can take a little bit of time to propagate. So what are the S3 guarantees? What does Amazon guarantee from S3? Well, it's built for 99.99% .99 availability and Amazon will guarantee 99.9% .99 availability. And Amazon guarantees 99.9999, I'm not gonna say it, but basically this is referred to as 11 nines because there's 11 nines there, um, durability for S3. So just remember 11 nines. And what does that mean? Well, that means if you put your object up in S3, it's not, it's very, very unlikely that it's going to be lost. It's only going to be lost um, one in however many nines that is. So it, it basically guarantees the um, durability of your object. And then S3 has this uh, following features. So it's got tiered storage. So it's got different storage tiers. And this is a fundamentally important topic going into your Certified Solutions Architect exam. This is worth like four or five points. You need to know the different um, tiers and we'll come on to that in a in the next slide. We also have lifecycle management. So you can actually uh, go through and move your objects around two different storage tiers. So you could say, hey, when this file is 30 days old, move it to this tier. When it's 90 days old, archive it off to Glacier. And I'll cover what Glacier is in a second. It also allows you to do versioning. So you can have multiple versions of objects in your uh, S3 buckets. Uh, you're allowed, to, you're able to encrypt your objects, you're allowed to encrypt them uh, at rest and there's a different encryption mechanisms which we'll cover off in another lecture. Um, again, this is really important. You're able to use multi-factor authentication for deleting objects. So when you turn this on, if someone goes in to delete an object, they're going to need two-factor authentication in which to do this. So they're going to need to use something like Google Authenticator. And then you secure your data using access control lists and bucket policies. And we're going to cover those off later on in this section of the course as well. So I talked about the different storage classes and how important they are to, um, you know, passing your exam. So let's cover them off now. So S3 standard, this is the one with 99.99% availability and 11.9's durability. And it's stored redundant across multiple devices in multiple facilities and is designed to sustain the loss of two facilities concurrently. So it is really, really highly available and highly durable. We then have S3 infrequently accessed. And this is basically for data that is accessed less frequently, um, but requires rapid access when you need it. So you get a lower storage fee than S3, but you are charged a retrieval fee. So if you've got data that you need to be able to instantly access, um, but you pretty much don't, you know, you don't use that data regularly, maybe you only need to check it uh, at the end of every month, then you'd want S3 infrequently accessed. You then also have S3 one zone infrequently access, and this is when you want a really low cost option for your infrequently accessed data and you don't even need, um, you don't have to worry about multiple availability zones. So it is literally just stored in one availability zone um, and it's infrequently accessed, but you still need to be able to um, access that data instantly. 
And then at reInvent in 2018, Amazon released S3 Intelligent Tiering. This is a really cool technology. This is using machine learning. And basically what it does is it looks at how often you use your objects and then it will move your objects uh, around the different storage classes based on what it's learned. So it will move it from S3 standard to S3 infrequently accessed because it knows that you don't access those files. So that's S3 Intelligent Tiering. Those are the four storage classes. We then have have Glacier and Glacier comes in two flavors. So we've got normal S3 Glacier and then we've got S3 Glacier Deep Archive. And so Glacier is basically for data archiving. So if you want to archive off your data, maybe you don't need it, maybe you have to hold on to it for seven years because of some federal regulation, you would be using Glacier. Now you can store any amount of data and it's really super, super cheap. Uh, and then your retrieval times are configurable from minutes to hours hours. Now with Glacier Deep Archive, that's the lowest storage um, class, that, your lowest cost storage class that you can buy, but your retrieval time is going to be 12 hours. So if you want to get the data back using Deep Archive, you, uh, you put in a request and it will come back 12 hours later. So um, those are the six different storage tiers. Uh, and you will need to remember those going into your exam. And so here is a table that compares uh, the different uh, storage tiers. Um, the thing that you should really note is the um, first byte latency. That's how quickly you'll be able to access your data. Um, so it's milliseconds for everything apart from S3 Glacier and uh, Glacier Deep Archive. So um, it can be minutes or hours, or it could be up to 12 hours if you're using um, Deep Archive. So bear that in mind as well. So how are you going to be billed for S3? Well, you're charged in the following ways. You're charged in terms of storage. So the more you store in S3, the more you're going to be billed. You're also charged on the number of requests. So if you're making a lot of requests to those objects, it's going to be more expensive. Um, you then get charged on the storage management pricing. So this is the different um, you know, tiers that are available. You then also get charged on data transfer pricing. And then you also get charged for transfer acceleration and cross-region replication. And don't worry, we're going to cover exactly what those two things are right now. So what is cross-region replication? Well, let's say you've got a bucket and it's in US East 1, and you want to automatically replicate your um, objects to another bucket that's in, uh, let's say, in Sydney. Uh, and you want to do that for high availability as well as um, you know, disaster recovery. So what will happen is as soon as you upload an object to your bucket in US East 1 and you've got cross-region replication turned on, those objects will automatically be um, replicated over to your bucket in Sydney. And we're going to have a lab on that coming up. We then also have S3 transfer acceleration. This enables fast, easy and secure transfers of files over long distances between your end users and an S3 bucket. And basically it's taking advantage of Amazon's CloudFront's um, globally distributed edge locations. And then the data arrives at an edge location. It's routed to Amazon S3 over an optimized, optimized network path. And essentially what they're doing is they're using the Amazon Backbone Network. So let's have a look at how this works. We've got our users all around the world, and then we've got our edge locations. And essentially, if you turn on transfer acceleration, they are uploading those uh, their files to the edge locations rather than to the S3 bucket itself. And then this goes over Amazon's Backbone Network, so Amazon's own network straight back to where your bucket is located. And can really speed up your users' um, upload times. And we're going to have a lab on that, and we're going to see how it works from all the different locations in the world coming up in this section of the course. So you've done really, really well. We're at the end of this lecture. Let's look at my exam tips. So just remember that S3 is object-based. It allows you to upload files. Those files can be zero bytes to five terabytes in size. There's unlimited storage, and your files are stored in these things called buckets. And a bucket is basically just a folder in the cloud. And S3 is is a universal namespace and all that means is that the name of your bucket must be unique globally. So you can't take test bucket for example, you won't be able to take a Cloud Guru bucket because I own that. Uh, and when you create your bucket, it's going to create a DNS name or a web address name. So it's going to be HTTPS forward slash forward slash a Cloud Guru, so the bucket name and then dot and then s3.amazonaws.com. That's if it's created in Northern Virginia, which is the default region 
or if you create it in another region, it will have the region um, name in the subdomain. So it'll be acloudguru.eu-west1, which is in Ireland, .amazon.aws.com. Moving on, uh, just remember that S3, because it is object-based, it's not suitable to install an operating system or a database on. So it's not, you know, that's not that type of storage. Um, for that, you will want block-based storage. This is object-based storage. So essentially, it's only used to store files. You're not going to install an operating system on S3, and you're not going to use it to host, host a database. And when you successfully upload an object to S3, you're going to get a HTTP 200 status code. Also, remember that you can protect your objects by turning on multi-factor authentication delete. That's really important to remember going into your exam. So that's how you can protect your objects so that somebody doesn't go in and accidentally delete them. They'll need to do multi-factor authentication. Remember the key fundamentals of S3. So what makes up an S3 object? Well, we have the key, and this is simply the name of the object. We then have the value, and this is simply the data and is made up of a sequence of bytes. We then have the version ID. This is important important for versioning. We have metadata, which is data about the data that you're storing. We then have um, some sub resources within here. So we've got access control lists and torrents and that access control list basically is the permissions um, that the, uh, of that object and you can lock each object down um, uh, individually. So you can do it at a bucket level and you can also do it at an object level as well. We're going to cover that off later on in the course. Now this is really important to remember the consistency model. So it's read after write consistency for puts of new objects. So as soon as you create a new object, you'll be able to read that object immediately. But if you update an object or delete an object and you try and read it immediately, you're going to only get eventual consistency. So you might get the older object um, or you might uh, still see the deleted file. Uh, but if you wait about a second, it's going to uh, be consistent. So you get eventual consistency. And pretty much the most important thing to remember going into your exam are the different storage classes. So we've got S3 standard. This is 99.99% availability, 11.9's durability. We then have S3 infrequently access. This is basically where you need, um, you know, you're going to pay a lower fee than standard S3, um, but you need instant access uh, and you are charged a retrieval fee as well. This, uh, we then have S3 one zone IA or one zone infrequently access. This is where you want a lower cost option for your infrequently accessed data, but you don't require multiple availability zones. And just so you guys know, prior to S3 one zone infrequently accessed, we had a storage class called um, S3 reduced redundancy storage or RRS. Um, they, that, that service still does exist, but it is being phased out. Uh, I just did the exam the other day and I was surprised to see it still mentioning RRS because it is being phased out. But just think, if you do see RRS in your exam, just think of S3 one zone uh, infrequently accessed storage. Um, that's basically more or less the same service. They're not quite the same because they have different availability, um, you know, SLAs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but essentially it's a place where you put your files where you don't care if you're going to lose them. If durability is not an issue, uh, you just want cheap cost of storage, then you want S3 one zone IA, or sometimes it's referred to as S3 RRS. Uh, we then have S3 intelligent tiering, uh, and this is basically using machine learning and it will move objects around um, the different uh, tiers of S3 to maximize your cost savings. We then have an S3 Glacier. This is for data archival and um, you can configure your retrieval times. Um, it can be anywhere from minutes to hours. And then if you want the, the lowest cost storage available, then you want S3 Glacier Deep Archive. And this is Amazon's lowest cost storage class where a retrieval time of 12 hours is acceptable. And then finally, the one thing I would say is go and read the S3 FAQs before taking the exam. S3 makes up a quite a bit of the exam. It's going to come up an awful lot. So just have a read through the S3 FAQs. Now, of course, the best way to learn anything with AWS is to get our hands dirty. So in the next lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to go in and create an S3 bucket. So if you've got the time, please join me in the next lecture. Thank you.